Well, I have good news this morning. We're finishing up our series on politics. That's always great, right? But there's bad news in there. The political season is actually just getting going, so we have a lot to endure this year. But thank you for hanging in there with me on this series. I know it's not fun stuff particularly to talk about the past two weeks, uh, but like I said last week, I think this is one of the things you excel at and you've handled it um, with grace and great conversations as you always have. So it's my hope that regardless of whatever happens in this political process, um, that A, we would stay united as a church, that we would hold together, that we'd hold our commitments as brothers, sisters in Christ above anything else, and that also we'd be a light to our community, to our community as it uh, wrestles with the differences, with the polarization going on in our country. But we've already talked about the hard stuff, okay? We've got that out of the way. So today, it's time to talk about the good stuff. Today, I bring to you the greatest hope in all of creation. If I could pick one sermon for you to be here in this series, it would be this sermon. So, <clears throat> so I'm glad you're here today. But for just a minute, just a minute, we have to talk about the problem. Because one of our biggest problems we have in politics today is the hopelessness we feel sometimes. The anxiety it causes, the, the hurts, the pains we have from it. See, we have strong opinions on issues or candidates. And the hard part with democracy is when the majority doesn't agree with you. And it doesn't work out the way you would hope it would go, which would leave you with a feeling of hopelessness. It can make us fearful for the future of our country, a feeling that a lot of Christians have with secularization and other things rising in our country, and we can feel a deep sense of loss in these moments as we try to cope with the ever-changing world, and I must confess I feel this way uh, sometimes with certain political issues, the ones that mean the most to me, and particularly those that know me well, it's probably something to do with wildlife politics that's got me anxious or something, but I want to break down this hopelessness further. I think it comes in two primary directions. The, the first is uh, wanting something to change, seeing the world the way it is and wanting something to change in the country. The best uh, example I could think of, and I didn't realize what the day was tomorrow when I was putting this together, was Martin Luther King Jr., his civil rights movement, uh, MLK's uh, desire to change Jim Crow laws and segregation and all those things. It was this hope that legislation would change a con the country to be a safer, a better, a more equal place. And so I love the phrase that Martin Luther King Jr. would say, how long, O oh Lord? It was a biblical phrase. This phrase is echoed throughout the Bible. And it's this phrase the, to call to God, to say, God, you see our circumstances. How long, O oh Lord, are you going to allow for these circumstances? Change it. Change these, uh, these, these issues going on in our world, in our country. The other hopelessness we feel is just the opposite of this. It is seeing something wanting to change, and you're like, you know what? The way it is is pretty good. I don't think we need to change it. Things seem to be going uh, pretty well. That might be more harmful than helpful. And so the question is, how do we deal with these feelings? How do we cope? How do we move on? How do we see a better future when things seem to be going really poorly? And to answer this question today, I'm going to use all the persuasive skills I possess because I have for you good news greater than any other hope and than any hope that any country in the history of the world is able to offer. That's the hope I have for you today. And in fact, I think I'm underselling it. So will you take with me our feelings of hopelessness to God in prayer right now. God, man, we can look at so many things going on in the world. And it can cause us to become anxious. It can cause us to become worried. It can cause us to become fearful. And so we bring those feelings to you. And we say, how long, O oh Lord? And we give them to you to work, to work on these issues, to work on these brokenness, to, broke, to work on the, the hurt in the world and to restore it. So may we find 
and giving this up to you and surrendering it, may we find a greater hope, a bigger hope, a deeper peace in our lives as we go through this election year. Pour through me the gift of preaching that Christ may be formed in hearts. It's in your name that I pray. Amen. So in order to give you this great hope, I have to take you through one of the saddest stories in all the Bible. It takes place in 1 Samuel chapter 8, and it sounds like this. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, you are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord and the Lord told him, listen to them. All the people are saying to you, it is not you they have rejected, but they have, re have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what a king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to these people who were asking him for a king. He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and some commanders of fifties and others to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and still others to make weapons of war and to equip for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards, olive groves, and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and to his attendants, your male servants and your female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys will be taken for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and, uh, and you yourselves will become his slaves. Now get this line here. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, but the Lord will not answer you on that day. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then he will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and to go out before us and to fight our battles. When Samuel heard all that the people said, he uh, repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. Here's why this is so sad. Before this moment, it was God who was leading Israel. It was God who made this promise to Abraham that he would give them and him and Sarah a child when it even seemed impossible to do such a thing. He said he would raise them into a great country. It was God who gave Joseph the power to interpret dreams. It was God who allowed them to move to Egypt to grow into a great nation. And when they grew into this nation, it was God who gave them the ten plagues to set them free. And when they stood on the edge of the sea, with Pharaoh's army crashing in, they were crying for help. And if you go back and read it, there's this great line in Exodus that says, you need not do anything. The Lord goes before you. He will fight his battles for you. All you need to do is be still. And so God parted the sea. For them. They went through on dry land. Pharaoh's army wiped out. God provided for them food and water in the wilderness. God went, went in and said, I'm going to give you the promised land, this land flowing with milk and honey. So they had this weird battle strategy. Like, you know what? Let's just march around the walls of this big city that everyone's terrified about. And then suddenly let's play some music and see what happens. It was like the greatest party of all time. All the walls came following down and everything. It was, it was bizarre. And that's the land they're in. And they say, ah, you know, God, it's been a good journey, but look at those other people. I mean, they got a king. Kings are pretty cool. Can we be like them? Can we, can we do this? And so that's what they go for. That's what they choose. They choose a king 
to go before them. They had the audacity to say, God, we don't want you in charge anymore. We want this king in charge. And from the perspective of the reader, you go, this is ridiculous. This is a horrible decision. How could they make this decision? But before we are so enlightened to think we are so much better, don't we do the same thing with our modern politicians? Our congressmen, our senators, our presidential candidates, they'll go on to promise us things that they could never live up to. There's no way they have the authority, the means, the power to do those things, but they'll promise us it in order to get our vote. And here's the greatest temptation, to believe them. One of my favorite things that happens, like it's generally four years later or a couple years after that, after an election, is when an investigative journalist goes in and they look at all the promises a candidate made and then they see how they delivered on those promises. Now, no one really reads those articles. It's not high on the viewership or anything like that. But when you come across it, you realize out of all the things they promised, they hardly delivered on any of the things they promised to do. But why don't we not read those things? Because the next candidate shows up and we're like, oh, this candidate, they're going to be different than the last one. They're going to fix all these issues. It's going to be better. That's the lie we tell ourselves. And we know deep down it's a lie. And so the question is, why do we do this? Why do we continually go through this cycle of thinking this person, this king, this president is going to solve our issues? It's for a very simple reason we do this. A biblical reason. We are built to bow. It's just how we are made as human beings. We are made to worship something. We have a hole in our hearts that only a king can fill. And so Israel says, we want a king. And God says, okay, here's Saul. How did it work out with Saul? Not very well. Okay, he didn't even make it through his term as king until they had to get rid of him. Then they bring in David. David, a, a God, a man after God's own heart. Seems pretty good, right? Until it was the time of year when kings went to war, when, when he was supposed to be going forward, fighting for his country. And he's like, you know what? I'll send Uriah there. I'll send Uriah to the front line so I can take what is his. As mine, so he can live out the very words of First Samuel chapter eight. And then, what about his son Solomon, the heir of this line? Pretty good guy, built the temple. Things seem to be going really well, but all of his uh, pagan wives and concubines tend to let lead him very far astray. See, the Old Testament is littered with some good kings, with some bad kings. But here's the deal: all of them fell short. None of them lived to the potential that God was calling them to live to. The story of the Old Testament echoes the story of humanity. That over and over again, we select a human leader and we say, this is the person. And they always fall short. They always let us down. But I have hope for you this morning. Because the story doesn't end there. The hope is that God knows our wants, but more than all of our wants, God knows what we actually need. So in the Old Testament, there is a prophecy that took place of a king that would come, and this would show up over and over again, especially in the book of Isaiah, that a king would come and restore all of these things, right all the wrongs, and would establish a kingdom that would never end. And so that's why the New Testament starts off with all thing, of all things, a genealogy. A genealogy of not just some average, ordinary person. A genealogy of a king. This is why a baby was born in a manger in the town of Bethlehem. Why Bethlehem? Because Bethlehem was a royal city. The city where kings were born. It wasn't uh, the wise men came from a long ways away to give some gifts to this king. Why? Because he was special. There was something important about him. Herod wasn't threatened by some average little boy. That's what, not why he was killing all the babies. This little boy had power, the power of a future king, and Herod wanted to protect his kingdom. 
What we just celebrated at Christmas was the arrival of the king. So when Jesus is being tempted by Satan, he's standing up there, and one of the things that Satan offers him is all the kingdoms of all the world. In other words, Satan is offering all the power and greed and wealth ever any dictator has ever desired. And Jesus turns it down. From start to finish, the work of Jesus is to bring in and declare the kingdom of God. And so next week, we're going to start to unpack what this kingdom looks like as we look at the Sermon on the Mount. But let me tell you first, one Passover. One Passover they remembered when lambs saved them, when God passed them by. And Jesus rode in on a donkey, a symbol of peace, overlooking the entire city. He rode in as king on Palm Sunday. He came into town and he goes up to pray on the Mount of Olives the night he's arrested. Why is that important? Because the first readers would have known the symbolism. They would have known that was the place where kings, where King David, where King Solomon would have gone to pray over the city of Jerusalem, where they would see the temple, where they would overlook the city. And so when he's arrested there, that should ring a bell, an alarm in our eyes. The, the night Jesus uh, was arrested... And sentenced to death, he was sentenced to death for being the king of the Jews. As much as the Sadducees protested it, the sign over the cross said, King of the Jews. But something happened different in the story here. Because the difference between every kingdom is kings die. We like to say, long live the king. But the king died, so it seemed like the movement was over. But Jesus fought the greatest battle of all, the greatest battle being that of death and won. And so after Jesus stayed with the people for a while, he did something very uh, significant because Caesar had died earlier. And when Caesar died, there was a comet ha that happened to be passing by at that time. And so they said, oh, this is Caesar, the deity, our king, ascending to heaven. So when Jesus ascends to heaven, Jesus is not just saying, oh, good luck guys, have fun down there, see you later. No, 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 it is witness, people see him ascending into the clouds because he is ascending to the throne. He is taking his rightful place as king of the universe. And so, if we are going to live out another election year, I think we need to know how to respond to this. I think we need to respond the way the first Christians respond to this. The first Christians would be brutally martyred because they believed someone else besides Caesar was actually ruling the world. The phrase they would often say that we sometimes sing about is Jesus is Lord. It's actually a political phrase. It was the political slogan or the motto of that day to say, Caesar is Lord. And so to say Jesus was Lord went directly against the politics of that day. The first Christians declared Jesus as king instead of uh, Caesar as king, and they were killed for it. So today I come to you. I come to you to launch a campaign. And the campaign is simple. Jesus for president. No, I'm not asking you to write in Jesus as president on the ballot. I don't know if the Supreme Court would reject that or not. We'll see. I have something greater to offer you. See, the first Christians didn't operate under the assumption that Jesus would return to earth, that would take over Rome and this earthly kingdom or any other earthly kingdom. No, no, no. They believed Jesus had already ascended. Therefore, Jesus was already king. Jesus was already ruling over the world, that Jesus had given the power of the Holy Spirit to his people and was guiding them and directing them to be the Lord's army on earth. Jesus had given them instructions and they were living out these instructions. So the call for Jesus as president is not a ploy to call for Jesus to be president of America. The call for Jesus to be president is the call for Jesus to be the Lord of your life. 
That's the call. It's a call in faith to live the ways of the kingdom of God above all other ways of this world. Jesus as president gives us hope. It gives us great peace in our hearts that God is in the midst of restoring all things. Jesus for president is the reminder to us that we often need that God's in charge. That God's really the one with the supreme authority. So politicians today, they might seek to make America great again, but Jesus is seeking to work, make the world great again. God is on a restoration path to restore things the way they were in the garden when everything was perfect. And nothing can deter God from that, that mission. And so in response to it, We've got a decision to make. The great temptation we face today is the temptation that the people living in Jesus' day faced. And let's not lie to ourselves. Let's not convince ourselves that we're so much smarter or so much educated and so much wiser that we would never do the same thing. So why'd they reject him? The king that they had been prophesying for, the king that they had been longing for, showed up. How could they possibly miss it, we ask, when we read this? They didn't. It just wasn't the king they wanted. They wanted a different kind of king. Like in, uh, just like the people in 2 Samuel chapter 8, they wanted an earthly king. They wanted a king that would get back at Rome, that would really rule things. They didn't want this heavenly kingdom. In fact, they so greatly rejected this kingdom. This is why they chanted and shouted, crucify him, crucify him, because they did not want this kingdom. And so the great temptation we face today is to, not, to deny or even crucify the ways of Christ in order to get our own way, in order to run the world the way we want to run the world. So the great call of faith that we are called to do is to worship Jesus as king. The great prayer we are to pray is your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what we're called to pray. The good news I have to offer you today is of a kingdom that knows no borders, that knows no boundaries. The great hope I have to offer you today is a kingdom that will never, ever end. So this brings me to this great hope. This great hope I've been talking about and offering. And it, I bring you, to show you this great hope, to the last book in the Bible. Revelation. Revelation is not this book of conspiracy theories or these weird things that most of the things are written about Revelation tend to say. It is a book written by John who after they tried Rome, tried to put him in boiling water, it didn't work, so they exiled him to the island of Patmos. And there he had visions. And he wrote a letter, a cryptic, coded letter that would pass through Rome to these Christians in Asia Minor. In Asia Minor at the time, there was believed to be only 300 Christians in all of Asia Minor. And they believed Jesus was king. And since they believed Jesus was king, they were being killed and ruthlessly treated for it. And so the crazy thing about the book of Revelation is that when the curtains rip between heaven and earth, we see who's truly winning. All the signs, everyone thought, oh, Rome is winning. This kingdom is going to last forever. But what John sees when he has his revelation is it's not Rome who's winning. It's a different kingdom who's winning. And so this is what it sounds like in Revelation chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, 
I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. To those who are thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all of this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. I have great news of hope for you today because the world doesn't end with apocalypse. It doesn't end with a nuclear war. It doesn't end with civil war. The world ends with Jesus coming to earth to be our king. That's how the world ends. And this is great news. It ends with the battle being won. It ends with all the king, with God's kingdom coming in full. And so we have to keep hold of this perspective. We must not lose this perspective. At the end of times, it won't matter what all any of our identities are. They just won't matter anymore. It won't matter if we're uh, liberal or conservative, Republican or Democrat. The only thing that's going to matter is our identity as children of God. Nothing else will matter. And all the things that we are tempted to give us security in life, our politics, our insurance, our wealth, whatever, those things all fall short because the only security we have is being found as God's children. So what John tells us in Revelations is the best is yet to come. How great is that? That all these amazing stories, accounts, the things we witness here, Oh, we got better stuff coming. And you know what? You and I will get to witness all of it together one day. What an amazing day that will be. But in the meantime, it takes great faith. It takes great faith because it takes delayed gratification. That Jesus will one day leave heaven and come to earth to be with us forever. But it was because of this belief that I need to remind you of some biblical truths. Truths we often forget in election years. See, as great as America is, as great as our democracy is, it is a human experiment that will not last forever. We must keep in perspective that the only kingdom that will last forever is the kingdom of God. And so, I hope that, Jesus, that, that America makes it until Jesus' is return. But regardless of what happens, we need to have faith to not be alarmed or concerned because we've read the back of the book and we know who wins, right? We want to be on the side of the winner. So here's the truth about what generally happens in election cycles. I doubt this one won't be much different. Some of your candidates will win. Some of them will lose. Some of the policies you hoped would pass will pass. Some of the policies you hoped wouldn't pass will also pass. But here's the next form of biblical truth I need to share with you. The best form of government is not a democracy. The best form of government is a theocracy. And at the end of the day, all of us will be laying our crowns at the feet of Jesus. Every single one of us. This is to say that, okay, our way, God, it didn't work so well. I'm giving up with my way. I am laying it at your feet because it really didn't turn out too well. And this, uh, this theocracy that we are building towards, that we are moving towards, is a future of surrender for us. And surrendering is one of the hardest things to do. Especially surrendering our need to run and rule the world. And so we sing, I surrender all. We sing when we, uh, we, because surrender is the thing we actually need. When we surrender, we find out this weird paradox in life that we actually gain. Israel thought they needed a king, and it turns out they did need a king. They needed King Jesus. It turns out that we need a king as well. We need this King Jesus, and so we surrender all because we trust that there is a loving God who understands what we need more than all of our wants in life. So let me tell you where our King is right now. Sometimes we ask in the dark days, in the hard times, in the difficult storms of life, where is Jesus? We cry out, where are you, God? And let me tell you where Jesus is. Jesus is on the throne. 
Kingdoms will come and go. Politicians and policies will come and go. And Jesus is on the throne. For us, it comes down to this. Some put their hopes in chariots. Some put their hopes in swords. But our hope, our hope is in the living God, the makers of heaven and earth. So this election year, you vote for whoever you think is best. Vote your conscience. But remember, they're not your president. They're not your king. No, we sing a different tune. We sing our hope is built on nothing less but Jesus' blood and righteousness. So I encourage you to look up this sermon on Tuesday, November 4th, 2024. You can find it on YouTube. You can find it on the podcast. Because here's the deal. Whether your, your candidate or candidates win or lose, whether you're happy or you're sad, Jesus is on the throne. Jesus is on the throne ruling all things. Jesus is king. And so beyond all the other things in this world, I believe that one day the trumpets will be sound. And that day the trumpets sound, I pray that we would be found in him that day. May we serve King Jesus as our president above all the other kingdoms of this world. Let's talk to our king right now. King Jesus, we come to give you all the honor and the glory and the praise because you alone are worthy for what you did for us, for what you went through for us, for this kingdom you've established. So forgive us, God. Forgive us when we bow to others, when we worship others, when we fail to make you the president of our lives, when we lose the perspective of where you are, when we give up hope, or we fail to see that you're the one who is actually in charge. So we thank you, Jesus, for being the king of our hearts, for the Lord of the world, for being the ruler of the universe. So we pray this all in your name, in the name of King Jesus, and all who agreed said, Amen. Amen.